Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I hope you guys are doing extremely well. So in this lecture, we'll be learning about time complexity. And this is the continuation of Strivers A to Z DSA course slash sheet. So uh, if you remember in the previous video, we have covered all of these green tick mark things. In this video, we'll be covering the time complexity. Learn basics and then analyze the next steps. What does that mean? I'll be teaching you the basics of time complexity. What is time complexity? How to compute time complexity and all the terms related to it. And then eventually when you go through all the later steps at every problem that we solve, we will be discussing time complexity of every problem in depth. So eventually when you complete all the steps or all the problems, you will have a very, very good hold on the time complexity part. Now in this video, I cannot teach you time complexity of uh, very complex codes because you do not know them, right? So once you learn the complex codes and recursion, backtracking, we will be discussing time complexity in depth over here. But as of now, just let's start with the basics. So the first question, what is time complexity? Now, what, why is time complexity required first of all? Now, whenever you're going to an interview, you might end up writing a piece of code, right? Now that code, how do, how does an interviewer judge that code? This is where they will analyze the time complexity of the code. Now they, they will not, they're not going to take your code, uh, run into a machine and see how much time does the machine take. And on the basis of that, tell you that your code is right or wrong. That is not going to happen. This is where something like time complexity comes in. Whatever code you're going to write in an interview, in every interview, they're going to analyze you what is the time complexity and what is the space complexity and then on the basis of that you will be judged right so whenever you write a code that might end up taking let's say two seconds on a machine or might end up taking three seconds on a machine might end up taking five seconds on a machine so the time taken will you call it the time complexity no you will never call time complexity as time taken. Now you might ask, but why? If a code is taking certain time, that should be its time complexity. Let's give you a very, very easy example to explain why not. Imagine I take this code. I take this code. This can be any code, any code. I take this code and I run it on two machines. One is the old Windows machine and the other one is the new MacBook machine. Now I am sure the old Windows hypothetically might end up taking two seconds to run that code while well, the new MacBook, which is a lot more in terms of the like lot more latest in terms of the configuration might end up taking one second. So does it mean that your code is taking one second or does it mean that your code is taking two seconds? It might happen. I bring up uh, some other machine the next day. It might end up taking less than one second. So depending on the system, the code ends up taking a different time. So that is why time complexity cannot be said as time taken because it is dependent on system. It is dependent on configuration, right? So this is why that is, this is the first point. Time taken is never equal to time taken, never ever. So you might ask if time complexity is not time taken, then what is it? That is where I see the definition. The rate, remember the rate at which the time taken increases the rate at which the time taken increases with respect to the input with respect to the input size rather so what does it mean let's explain this with the help of a graph so again let's take the same example where i'm saying i have a old uh, windows machine and i have a new macbook okay now imagine you are giving the old windows a size 10 just as hypothetical a size 10 input size and i'm plotting the graph and this is one second this is two second this is three second this is four second this is five second this is 10 input size 20 30 40. at 10 input size it might end up taking two seconds at 20 it might end up taking four at 30 it might end up taking six which will be here so you see the time increasing at some at some theta angle like it's increasing at a certain slope so this increase 
this increase this theta angle is what you call as the rate of increase this is what you call the rate of increase okay now let's see the new macbook so if i take the new macbook the 10 might end up taking one second the 20 might end up taking two seconds the 40 might end up taking three seconds so it's here 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 so this is the rate and this theta is the rate for the new macbook so i can say the rate at which it increases time is what you call as time complexity depending on the input if they are giving you more input it might end up taking a certain more time so the rate at which the time increases is what is generally referred as time complexity of any given code the next question that might come to your brain is okay striver if we are saying the time complexity is not computed in terms of seconds or minutes then how do we how do we write it this is where something like a big o a big o notation comes in now in all the interviews that you're going to give or in all the examinations if you're writing a piece of code they will ask you to analyze the time complexity that is when you do not like you will not say two seconds no you will say it in terms of big o notation every piece of code takes time in terms of big o notation what is big o notation i'll just give you a prime example so it's like a capital o open parenthesis and a close parenthesis this is what big o notation is and inside it you write whatever the time is taken inside is you write the time taken or the hypothetical time which i'll show you how to compute let's take a very very small example to compute the time complexity of a certain code so imagine i write the for loop i've already taught you loops in the previous video i equal to one i lesser than five i plus plus and then i write c out and my name raj okay so can you tell me what is the bigo of this this is nothing but the number of steps that this code will take first step is very sure assigning the second step is comparison the third step is printing right and then you come across and this is your fourth step and then again you check this is your fifth step and then again you print this is your sixth step so this is how every step is computed so whatever is the total number of steps that is what you write inside it and that is what you call as the prime big o notation but you cannot just keep on counting step one step two step three step four step five step six step seven that is insane you just cannot keep on manually counting the steps this is where three rules come in and i'll write the rules the three rules are very simple always compute time complexity in terms of worst case scenario time complexity to be computed in terms of worst case scenario why worst case i'll explain you the next one is avoid constants avoid constants and the third uh, and the third is avoid lower values so if i have to compute the time complexity or the big o of this piece of code Let's look at it on a very higher level. Can I say this for loop is running for five days? I can. At every time, what is happening? It's like increment, check, print, increment, check, print. So can I say for every time it's operating twice? For every time it is operating three times. Increment, check, print. Five into three. Can I say this? I can. So can I say a total of 15 times? That is how you write it. You write it as big O of 15 is what you write. Now this is time complexity. It runs for 15 times. But this is a number. This is a number. You generally do not represent your code in terms of numbers. Okay. So let's let's change this. Now, can I say this? If I change uh, this to minute, if I if I probably will change this to lesser than n lesser than equal to n so now can you say how many times will this loop run i know one thing this is going to run for 
we go of n times. The loop, the code will run for n times, n iteration. And at every iteration, one, two, three things will happen. At every iteration, three things will happen. Pretty obvious. This is what will be the time complexity. We go off 3n. We go off 3n will be your time complexity. So whenever you're saying we go, you go to the code and you see how many times it is running. And then you write we go off 3n as your time complexity. Does that make sense? It does, right? Okay, let's now come back to the three points that I've written. Always compute time complexity in terms of worst case scenario. Now there are three things. One is the best case. One is the average case. And the other one is the worst case. Now let's take a snippet of the code and explain you what is best case, what is average case, and what is worst case. Okay, let's. So this is the snippet of the code. Now imagine the snippet of the code is very simple. It states if Marx is less than 25, print grade D. It states if Marx is less than 45, print grade C. If Marx is less than 65, then you go ahead and print grade B. Or else you go ahead and print grade A. So let's talk about the best case scenario. What is best case? When the program takes the least amount of time. So over here, can I say, if someone gives you an input of marks equal to let's say 10 what will happen this will execute it and grade d will be printed and none of these lines will be executed none of these lines so can i take can i say the number of operations will be just one a check and a print which is like two operations which is like two operations can i say that? imagine if i give you marks equal to uh, 70 so at marks 10, it was we go off two operation. Correct? We go off two operation. Now, if I give you marks equal to 70, what will happen? Check false. Check false. Check false. It comes here. Three and then four. Can I say four operations were here? Like one, two, three, and then goes to else. Somewhere around four operations. So it takes four operations. So whenever you're analyzing the time complexity, will you say that my code runs in week of or will you say that your code runs in week of 4? Obviously, you will say week of 4 because that might be the worst case that the computer might encounter when it is given an input. So always, yes, always compute the time complexity in terms of worst case scenario. And if they will ask you the best case, you know the best case. Whatever is the best case, like in this case, is the first if statement getting executed, which is we go off two operations. So you've got an idea about the best case and the worst case. You know what is the average case? There's nothing but the best plus worst divided by two. It's, it's the median of it. So pretty self-explanatory. Why? If I give you a question, why do we compute it in terms of worst case? The answer is again self-explanatory. If you're building a system, Will you build it for one person or, or will you build it for one million person if given an option, if given an option, you will say one million because you want to build a system which can scale up. You always think of the worst that can happen. That is why when I talk about time complexity, your code extreme worst case is what is considered while computing time complexity. Now let's talk about constants. I'm saying avoid constants. Why am I saying that? Let's take a shuttle example. Let's take something like 4n cube, something like 3n square plus 8. Let's take this. So over here, 4n cube plus 3n square plus 8. These are the number of operations that your code is taking. Hypothetically, I do not have a piece of code. I'm just taking a hypothetical we go expression. Now imagine if I tell you that the input size n. The input size n is somewhere around 10 to the power 5, right? I'm saying 10 to the power 5 is the input size. So when I say 10 to the power 5 and you put that in, what will, what will it be? 10 to the power 15, 10 to the power 5 cube, 15 plus 3n square. That's 3 10 to the power 10 plus 8. Tell me a very 
ईजी थिंग टेन टू दी पावर फिफ्टीन प्लस टेन टू दी पावर टेन इंटू प्लस एट विल दिस एट हैव एनी सिग्निफिकेंट इन दी ऑपरेशन दिस इज इन इट सेल्फ सच ए ह्यूज नंबर इफ यू एड एट विल इट विल इट मैटर टू दम टेक लाइक बिलियन लाइक वॉट एवर इज टेन टू दी पावर फिफ्टीन आई नॉट श्योर वॉट इट इज इज आई बिलियन ट्रिलियन वॉट एवर लाइक मोर देन दैट आई गेस विद दैट प्लस एट डज इट हैव अ सिग्निफिकेंट it doesn't if you're earning 1 million and i give you one buck that will not have any significance that is why we do not consider constants we do not consider constants now in terms of code imagine i say you something like this i n t x equal to 2 so this is the modified code this is the modified code x equal to 2 and then the for loop so this is one operation it's it's something like n into 3 plus 1 The time complexity updated will be n into three plus one operation, and this is the one operation. So you never ever take this unit operation. So you will not consider this. You will say no. It will still stay as n into three. I will avoid constants because whenever the input size is very large, those constants have very less significance. Got it? Now let's take the next thing. Avoid lower values. Let's take the same example. I am saying ten to the power of fifteen. Ten to the power of fifteen. If you add ten to the power ten to it, will it have any significance? It won't. So adding ten to the power ten to ten to the power fifteen, ten to the power fifteen will have absolutely no significance. It is similar to saying I will add, uh, let's say, one to thousand, even even lesser than that. Uh, it is similar to actually saying one to, yeah. I'm adding one to this much or oh, one more zero. Yeah, will it have any significance? No. So adding this one to this one, will it have any significance? No. The number of operations will be like slightly more, slightly more, because ten to the power five, fifteen in itself is such a huge number. But this is why again something very important: avoid the lower values, which does not change its significance by much. So avoid lower values. Got it? So these are the three points. That you will always keep in mind while computing the Bigo notation because Bigo notation is what you will be expressing your code in interviews. Always, all the problems that I'll be solving, I'll be telling you about Bigo notation only. Apart from Bigo notation, there are certain other terms like theta notation, omega notation. And you'll find a lot of other terms in textbooks. Are they required in interviews? No. No one is going to ask you these things. No one. But just for knowledge. Let me tell you, the Bigo notation is always the highest complexity or the worst case complexity. Remember this: worst case complexity or the highest, or generally known as the upper bound complexity. It's known as the upper bound. The omega is the lower bound. As I said, the kind of the best case is the lower bound or the lowest bound or whatever you can. And this is nothing but the average complexity. just a quick disclaimer there are a lot of theoretical stuffs revolving around bigo theta omega a lot of limit derivations but i am not teaching you theory stuff i'm not teaching you for your uh, semester examinations i am teaching you for interviews i am preparing you for the dsa coding rounds and they will not be asking you over there they'll be asking you programming logic you'll have to solve problems they won't be asking you Tell the formula for Bigo notation in limit terms. No one is going to ask. Might be asked in semesters. For that, you'll find different teachers on YouTube. If you are learning from me, you're learning for interviews, for coding rounds, for problem solving abilities, not for your semester exam. So please do not comment that you did not teach the mathematical derivation because that is something which is not required while problem solving, right? So you know how to compute Bigo now. Let's uh, do one thing. Let's uh, quickly solve uh, some questions. Okay. So the first snippet of the code for which you have to find the time complexity. Imagine inside your main, you have something like i and t i equal to zero, i lesser than n, i plus plus, and for i and t j equal to zero, j lesser than n, j plus plus, and Imagine it. It has a block of code like something, a single line of code, and this is your entire snippet of the code. Okay, this is your some block of code. 
you can consider this to be taking very constant time constant time so this can be avoided tell me the time complexity you know time complexity will be computed in terms of big o notation tell me the time complexity of this particular code pause the video and maybe think about it and then see if you are correct or not so how do you analyze the time complexity of snippets of the code it's very simple analyze how is the code working so if you see the outer loop is starting from i equal to 0 and going till n so it's definitely running for n times and the inner loop is going from j equal to 0 till n this is also running for n times now if you're a beginner you might find it a bit difficult so what you will do is you will say at i equal to 0 what is happening let's see whenever i is 0 what is happening whenever i is 0 it goes inside and j starts its value from 0 and goes till n and this completes n iterations can i say when i is uh, 0 j goes from 1 0 1 2 3 dot 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 till n can i say that and then again when the i is value increases to 1 can i say j again goes from 0 1 2 3 because it's inside it it's reiterating again from 0 can i say if i is 2 again it again goes from 0 till n can i say till i is n minus 1 why n minus 1 because it is lesser than n can i say it again goes from 0 till n or other than n minus 1 to be very accurate can i say this so what is happening every time it is running for n n n n every time it is running for n n n so can i say it's running for n times first then for another n times second time then for another n times second and then dot 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 till n times how many times is it running can i say it's running for exactly n times so can i say this is nothing but n into n yes thereby n square is the number of iterations it is taking yes there are other things as well like increase comparison but we usually do not consider which rule avoid lower values if you remember because 3 into something won't matter that much so yes you can avoid it so what i can say is it's running for n square yeah if you want to consider all these constant operations you can do it that is your wish i usually do not do it so we go of n square is what is the time complexity of this particular let's take the next example and try to compute the time complexity of this one so it's like the first loop is definitely running for n and the second loop is running from 0 to i so let's analyze slowly and then probably we'll get the time complexity so can i say if i equal to 0 j is nothing but from 0 j is only running for 0 can i say this because when i is 0 j is running for 0 j less than equal to 0 so it will run for just one time 12 when i becomes 2 what happens j now runs for 0 sorry when i becomes 1 rather when i becomes 1 what happens j now runs for 0 and 1 can i say that? why because i is 1 it's like 0 lesser than 1 correct nice can i say if i is equal to 2 what happens j now runs for 0 1 2 so when i at the end becomes n minus 1 what will happen j will be 0 1 2 dot dot, dot n minus 1 can i say this is how many operations it is taking again i'm ignoring all these constant operations i'm taking the overall iterations now the first time it's one iteration next time it's two next time it's three four until n so can i say the number of iterations the first time it is one the next time it is two the next time it is three the next time it is four so on till n iterations can i say that? and do you remember the formula for this particular thing some of the first n natural numbers simple maths n into n plus 1 whole divided by 2 which is nothing but n square by 2 plus can i say n by 2 thereby this is the exact time complex but we can avoid if you remember the rules constant to be avoided like the smaller values to be avoided so it'll be like n square by 2 so this is the time complexity Again, if you try to remove the constants like one by half, you can say the time complexity is near about we go of n square. 
But if someone does ask you the exact time complexity, this is the exact time complexity. But according to the rules, this is what it boils down to. So these were the basics of time complexity. Okay. Now next, I'll be doing all these patterns in the next lecture. Where I'll be writing all the nested for loops. And there you can analyze time complexity in a much better way. But eventually, all the time complexity terms like log n, n log n, n square, n cube, uh, n square log n, all of these things you will see as I proceed with the playlist. So I do not want to rush you in. I just want you to get an overview of what is time complexity, how to think on it, how to compute, how to avoid terms. These things should be crystal clear to you. So I'm assuming the time complexity uh, stuff is crystal clear to you. So I'll now be moving to something like space complexity. Again, what is space complexity? It's the memory space that your program takes. It is the memory space that your program takes in a very, very naive term. When I talk about memory space, again, it will vary from machine to machine. So you cannot be dependent on the machine. And that is why, again, in order to compute space complexity, we will be using the Bigo notation again. So Bigo notation is kind of very, very important. In all the interviews, Bigo in terms of time, Bigo in terms of the space. So we'll again be using Bigo notation and you know the reasons why not in terms of uh, KB, MB, GB, etc. So what is exactly the definition of space complexity? It is nothing but auxiliary space plus input space. What is auxiliary space? The space that you take to solve the problem. The space that you take to solve the problem. Input space, the space that you take to store the problem. Space that you take to store the input rather, not the problem. So let's give a very, very small example in order to explain what is auxiliary space and what is the input space. So I'll write a very, very uh, small thing. Imagine I'm taking an input of A and B. In Java, you know how to take it and in C++, you know. So I'm assuming I'm taking an input of A. Uh, so I'm not writing any syntax because then it'll be C++ or Java specific. I just want you to uh, learn pseudocode and the logic. So in, imagine I give an input to variable A. Imagine I give an input to variable B. And I'm saying C equal to a plus B. Now I'm saying C equal to A plus B. So the auxiliary space that you're using is an extra C variable. This is the auxiliary space. Why? Because you're using a C variable in order to solve the problem. Hey, you cannot use that is okay. But I'm saying if you use any extra variable or extra space to solve the problem, that is what you refer as auxiliary space. What about the input space? This is one and this is one. So both of these can be referred as input space, whereas this can be referred as auxiliary space. And combined, I can say this is the space complexity or I can say we go of three over here because you're using three different variables. You can convert them into bytes. If you're taking an integer, you can convert them into bytes. I am not concerned about this. In an interview, you will have to say it in terms of we go of something, not in terms of bytes, KB, MB. So for an example, if I define an array of size N, it means I'm consuming B go of N size or N space complexity. So in an interview, if you are solving a problem which uses an array of size N, you say B go of N is the space complexity that I am using. As simple as that. Now, a thing that I want to highlight over here is if you're doing space complexity, a lot of times uh, it will happen is imagine you're given an input to A, imagine you're given an input to B and the task is to some uh, add both the numbers. A lot of people say I'll do this B equal to A plus B. So the summation of A plus B will be stored in B and I'll not be using the third variable. It is okay to do. It is okay. But this is something you should avoid. It takes lesser space. But in an interview, the interviewer will say this 
method is not done. Why is it not done? Just think in, pers uh, in perspective of software engineering. Imagine you are writing a code for a big uh, MNC and they're giving you some data. They've given you some set of data and they want you to do something on that data. And you're like, you manipulate the data. Over here, you change the data. You changed B. This is why never ever do anything on the input. Very, very crucial rule in interviews. Never do anything to the input. Never do anything to the input unless the interviewer sees anything to the input because data should not be touched. You can do whatever you wish by taking the data, but you cannot do on the data because if you manipulate the data, it has an issue because in software engineering, that data might be used in some other place. So never ever manipulate data. This might save you a bit of space. But the interviewer will end up rejecting you because this is a very, very bad practice. So never ever do anything to the input given. Always take extra variables, extra array, extra matrix. It might be tempting that if you use the same input variables, you will end up taking lesser space. But it's it's not a big concern. If you're using B go of n space, like if 2n is used by taking an extra array, it is okay. This is okay. No one is going to reject you if you're using big of 2n instead of big of n. If the interviewer specifically says, do it on the input, then you can use the input. Otherwise, do not. And you can tell that to the interview. You can explain that. I do not want to, uh, I do not want to tamper with the data. That is why I'm taking an extra variable in order to solve this problem. Keep this in mind forever. So this was about the high level idea about space complexity and the practices you should follow. Regarding the in-depth knowledge, when we solve different problems, on different data structures, you will see how I'll be explaining space complexity in depth because the more problems you solve, the space complexity gets into your head in a much, much better way. So before ending up this lecture, in case you are into competitive programming, then remember one thing over there, you do not run your codes on your MacBook or your windows, whatever code you write, you send it to the server. So there is a server. You send it to the server. Everyone sends to the same server and these servers in competitive programming or let's say you're using lead code or let's say code studio or let's say GFG, any platform if you're using, they have their servers and most of the servers take one second for 10 to the power eight operations. Remember this, most of the servers, most of the server take one second for roughly 10 to the power eight operations. Might be 10 to the power 8 plus something, might be 10 to the power 8 minus something. But roughly it is 10 to the power 8 operations is what you can execute in one seconds on the server. Most of the servers are relatively the same. And if they're saying two seconds, it doesn't mean 10 to the power 16. It doesn't. It doesn't. It means 2 into 10 to the power 8 operations. If they're saying five seconds, it means 5 into 10 to the power 8 operations. Do not do 10 to the power 8 to the power. Do not a lot of people do that. Okay. So this is something just keep in your mind because a lot of times you will see time limit one second. They'll write it. They'll write it in your, uh, let's say coding round, but the time limit given to you is one second where you should analyze that the time complexity of your snippet of the code or your entire code should be roughly be go of 10 to the power eight operations. If in a coding round, they are stating time limit one second. It means roughly when you compute the time complexity of your code, avoiding constants, avoiding lower values, it should be BGO of 10 to the power 8 operations. So with this, I will be uh, completing the step 1.1. Guys, I hope you have understood everything over here. And the next lecture will be about uh, do all these patterns. Yes, I'll be doing all of these patterns, each of them, 22 of them in the next lecture. So just in case, you have understood time complexity and space complexity in depth. We have a ritual on TQ forward on every lecture. If you understand everything right at the end of the lecture, you drop a comment understood in the comment section so that I get that belief that you guys are understanding. I get that motivation that I come back and record these videos. So please, please do consider dropping the comment understood. If you're new to our channel, please, please do consider subscribing to us. If you haven't checked out uh, Strivers A to Z DSA course, the link will be in the description. And you get everything on the description, my LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, everything. You can follow me at uh, any any of these places. And if you are learning online, you can always use the hashtag uh, that is over here. 
And with this, I'll be wrapping up this video. Let's play in some other video. Till then, goodbye. Take care.